Good morning, everyone. How is everyone doing today? It is a blessing to see you. Um, we're trying out, we're continuing to try out the new technology downstairs. So when that time comes and we can have people in the fellowship hall having Sunday school and be able to uh, teach so that both can see on Zoom and in the fellowship hall. So that's as we are continuing to work with that. Thank you for your patience and uh, hopefully we'll just have it ready by the time it's time to do it. Amen. Uh, John the Baptist appears is our lesson for today and we're coming out of Luke 3. So it's a, it's a chalk field lesson. So we're going to go ahead and get started here. Most gracious and heavenly father, we thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. And we thank you for the dawning of this new day. Lord, we just thank you that you've allowed us to see it and that you are continuing to um, let us come together, fellowshipping with each other and studying your word. Lord God, we ask right now that you would touch Sister Linda and her situation. Lord, you know what she stands in need of the best. And we ask that you would provide that Lord and give her the strength, the wisdom and the uh, courage to be able to go through what she's going through, Lord. We know you're able. And we know you can do all things well. So we wait in anticipation for how you'll work out that situation. Touch us, Lord, now as we hear your word. Help us to be able to soak it in and, um, Father God, share it with somebody else and live it out uh, so that others can see how great you are. We love you and we give you the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So. Hopefully, um, since I'm downstairs in the fellowship hall, there are some, some doors and spaces around us that people might be coming in and out with the hopes that they will be quiet and you won't hear all of that. <laughs> all right, for those of you who might be on the line that's new, uh, if you need to raise your hand, uh, you can hit star nine to raise your hand and then star six to unmute yourself. Um, Oh, sorry, that's on your phone. And if you're on your computer, if you go down to the reactions and hit that button, it gives you an opportunity where you can raise your hand. Uh, and if our tech team is there watching, we you wave and they can catch you and raise your hand. Because we have a lot of, of questions today. So I'm hoping people will chime in in whichever way they feel most comfortable. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to have our opening exercise and kind of look at the lesson points and how we might have life application with that uh, overview of Luke 3 uh, up until the point of our, our scripture for today, then our actual scripture text um, broken out. And then I, I want to have you hear the text in between what is actually the printed text. It gives you context. Um, and then there's a song, Prepare Ye the Way, and we will close with pastor's remarks. Okay, open an exercise, warm you up, because remember I said we have a lot of um, questions, so I'm, I'm warming you up, okay? What kinds of things do you do um, to prepare for Christmas? What kinds of things do you do to prepare for Christmas. What kinds of things do you do to prepare for Christmas? I'm trying to see how I can get that bar off so y'all won't have to look at that. Okay. Okay. You want me to start reading, Reverend Graham? Or? Absolutely. Okay. So we have people that put decorate the house. Um, someone says clean. Mm -hmm. Someone else said deep clean for guests to come over. Mm -hmm. uh, make a list. Pull out the Christmas decorations. Okay. And that's what we have so far. Okay, we have one that's in here, plan the menu. <laughs> yeah, plan the menu. <laughs> All right, so y'all warmed up. Y'all, That was a good question. Y'all ready to go. 
Uh, Aaron, can you let me know, do you all see the bar at the top of the screen or are you just seeing my PowerPoint? Oh, no, we just see your PowerPoint. Okay, all right, just check it. All right, so um, there's lots of points. Um, it will make sense once we dig into it, but these are all things we can do um, to prepare spiritually, not only for Christmas, but for life. Uh, hear God, obey God, fulfill God's plan. Enlighten God's people, know God, give God the glory, know God's rewards and consequences, and urge God's people, preach God's gospel. Um, and so that life application, which will come from those points, is to daily do things to prepare the way of the Lord. <clears throat> all right, so it will all come together. And we're going to start um, with a brief little um, kind of introduction to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3 in five minutes. If you want this free handout, you can get it in the link down below. When Luke chapter 3 opens up, where are we in history? Well, Luke places it in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, which might not tell you much. We know that Tiberius Caesar took the throne September the 18th, 14 AD, which would place the events of Luke chapter 3 right around 29 to 30 AD. Jesus was 12 years old in chapter 2. We've now skipped 18 years. He's now 30. The second half of the chapter is Jesus' family tree, and it dates his relatives from 1 AD all the way back to the beginning of the world. There's a lot of interesting and unique characters in chapter 3. Tiberius Caesar, the emperor of Rome, Pontius Pilate, the governor of Judea. Then there's a couple guys that go by the title of Tetrarch, Herod and Philip. Herod and Philip are half-brothers. Uh, the first one, he's Herod Antipas, and the second one is Herod Philip II. We have Annas and Caiaphas, who filled the role of high priest in a very unique way. And then John, who's John the Baptist, Elizabeth and Zachariah's son, who has now grown up right alongside Jesus. And then we have Jesus' relatives at the end of the chapter, all the way back to Adam and Eve. Chapter 3 is going to open with John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, which is a desolate area that descends from the hill country of Judea down to the Jordan River and the Dead Sea Valley. Let's talk about our overview now. So Luke is going to set the stage in the beginning of the chapter, listing all of the national and the regional rulers. And those are a lot of those men we just talked about. Tiberius, Pilate, Antipas, Philip, Licinius, Annas, Caiaphas. They were all governing in the Roman Empire. And so Luke does that to set the stage on which the, the Messiah is going to arrive. The chapter then moves into a discussion of the ministry of John the Baptist. He was a prophet of God, specifically chosen for that role. And Luke tells us that he was in the wilderness of Judea teaching around the Jordan River area. Many Jews were coming to John, and he was instructing them to be baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. Luke tells us that his ministry, his work, was a fulfillment of a prophecy that is found all the way back in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 through 4. John really sternly rebuked the Jewish religious leaders, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He told them that they needed to repent, that they needed to stop relying on their Jewish heritage, believing that that was enough to make them right with God. And the people who were honest came to John and they started to ask him what they needed to do in order to live a godly life. And so he told the common people and the tax collectors and the soldiers what they could do in order to live in a way that was pleasing to God. And that's verses 2 through 14. Now we get to verse 15 through 20, and the people begin to question John's identity. They kind of begin to wonder if maybe he's the Messiah. But John is very clear that he is not the Messiah. The Messiah is going to come after him. He's preparing the way, and the Messiah is going to come with blessings that are much more robust than John could bestow. John says, I baptize with water, but the Messiah is going to come, and he's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. All right, so that gives us kind of an overview of chapter three, right up to um, where we pick off in our, uh, pick up in our lessons, that's our printed text. And I thought it was good because it kind of encapsulated who all of those people were in that first um, part of the verse that gets not put in the text for whatever reason they decided to do that. So you have a little context of about what's going on around um, in that time when John is, John the Baptist is getting ready to hit the scene. Okay. So, okay. Okay. So this is now part of our printed text. The word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. 
he went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. The and, word of God came. And this is the text that wasn't printed, so we have the context of what's happening. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, The man with two tunics should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. Tax collectors also came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, What should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, And what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. Okay, so this is important text that um, gets kind of pulled out. And I know they pull stuff out because you can't cover it all in a, a typical Sunday school time. But these are some of the things that um, John was telling them as he was preaching and teaching to them about all of the things that they needed to be doing on this walk with Christ that's coming. All right. John said to the crowd. Okay, and then this is the other part of our printed text. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Christ. John answered them all. I baptize you with water. But one more powerful than I will come, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and preached the good news to them. All right, so that is our actual, those are our actual scriptures for today. All right, so let the questions begin. I, I was thinking as I was reading, I was like, it's a familiar passage. And when I'm reading something that uh, is familiar to me, I, I have to be careful not to gloss over parts because you feel like, okay, I already know this. Um, so when I look at well-known passages, I ask questions. Um, and asking questions can be a good way to explore the different aspects of the passage uh, that may speak to us afresh and anew. If we, if we just read it and we know it, we might not pick out some of the stuff that's important for us to, to look at. So we're going to read this familiar passage and answer questions to spark some thought, to spark some new, um, perhaps revelation, to spark allowing God to speak to. Okay, Reverend Graham has frozen. Um, so give us one second. First verse was. Okay, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the wilderness. And um, this one verse stirs up uh, a lot of questions for us to consider. So the word of God is that first little part came to John. How do we hear God? Can you hear God when he is speaking to you? How do you know if it is God who is speaking to you? And we hear a lot of words today. Are we hearing the word of God? Now, as I'm asking these questions, I'm, I'm 
I imagine you're not going to be able to answer all of them, but if one of those strikes you, please answer, raise your hand or put it in the chat. How do we hear from God? Because as Christians, that's going to be something that the people who come to us, who know we're Christians, who have that question, they want to know. How is it that you, you hear from God? How do you know if it's God who is speaking? Um, and when we have all of the things that we hear every day coming at us, uh, are we hearing the word of God? Do we take time to make sure that it's the word of God we're hearing? Um, and being able to help people to understand that's gonna be important as we prepare the way. That's kind of that theme down there, that life application that we talked about, prepare the way of the Lord. Answering, helping answer some of these questions are going to be helpful for people as we prepare the way for the Lord. Okay, and then the other part of that verse, and if you're typing or answering, keep 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 going because this whole slide can generate questions that you might want to answer. And John got his marching orders from God in the wilderness. It says this, he was in the wilderness. How has God used the wilderness in the Bible? He's used the wilderness in different situations uh, that people were going through. Have you ever been in a wilderness uh, situation? And how has God used your wilderness experience in your life, in the life of others uh, that you come in contact, contact with? And how can you be attentive to God's word when in the wilderness season? Because it said the word of, of God came to John in the wilderness. So how can we be attentive to God's word when we're in a wilderness situation? So that's a, a, a lot, like I said, for this, that one part of that verse is how can we hear from God? Do we know if we're hearing from God? Uh, and what is it that God is saying? And then how has he used the wilderness um, in his word? And how is he will, using a wilderness experience for you to be able to learn something, to grow closer to him. All of these are, are wonderful things that we can think about and ask his, his guidance for as we are studying this passage. So do we have anybody who wants to tackle any and all of those? Okay, I don't see anything in the chat, but somebody might want to raise their hand and, and oh. ask a question. So you give them a minute, we can see if someone to type something, but you might have to call on some people, Reverend Grant. <laughs> I, I mean, it's some, these are some important questions. How oh, do no, you... Somebody, oh, they okay. did, they were typing. I'm so sorry. Okay, they type, 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 all right. So, so Sister um, Joyce Hogard, she put, how do we hear God when we pray and ask for guidance? We prepare ourselves to hear God's word. The word of God will come to us through written messages, words spoken by someone else, or our own thoughts that resonate as the answer we need. Amen. Amen. Okay, and then someone else put to question one. We hear God, we hear from God through his word by reading, praying, and meditating on his word. We can also hear from God through other believers. However, his word will never contradict his word. And that came from Sister Sharon Wooddunn. Amen. Amen. Okay, and that's all in the chat. Anybody been in the wilderness? Had a wilderness experience? All right, you do have one hand raised, Reverend Dr. Julie Gray, so I've asked her to unmute. Okay. Wow. <laughs> I have heard from God on several occasions. One, I've heard from him speak to my heart audibly. I actually heard the words audibly through my heart. Um, I've heard um, from God while sleeping. And I wake up and I have this, this thought 
um, and I, I get up and I write it down, or I might be preparing to preach or to study. And I get up and I write it down. Um, um, he gives me songs. And those songs, when I go look at them and I learn them, they, they, they speak to me uh, in ways of um, how much he cares for me, how much he loves me. Um, uh, there, there are songs that, in, that encourage me, especially during times when I really need to be, be encouraged. Um, and, and like um, Sister Hogarth said, he speaks, um, he speaks when you pray um, and he speaks through other people. Absolutely. Amen. So it's encouraging to hear that we are hearing from God because that is important. We do get so much information thrown at us today and ciphering what is God and what's not God is going to be very important for us. And I, I don't want to leave without touching on the wilderness because sometimes as Christians, we will have some wilderness experiences. And if you realize that Jesus, um, had time in the wilderness. He was sent out to the wilderness and the, the enemy came to tempt him in that wilderness. We can learn a lot from our wilderness experiences. They usually are uncomfortable, but they don't. that doesn't mean we can't learn from it and grow from it so that we can better um, be, be better able to prepare the way of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And then you had um, one more comment that came into the chat and you had a hand raised um sister okay. Helen, knowing flight but um the comment that some sister helen bowman she said i have not heard an audible voice of god but you feel a certain way when you have asked god a question a quickening or we get a feeling of comfort and peace yeah. so that's yeah. from sister helen bowman and then i'm muted uh sister naomi flight Oh, well, I don't usually try, I try not to get started on some of this, but, but sometimes I just can't. It's like fire shut up in my bones, I guess I should say. But uh, for me, um, when I hear from God and I know it's God, I'm doing things that in the carnal mind I wouldn't do. I'm just going to use one example. I've had many, but uh, <clears throat> when I had lost my job, uh, which was about uh, uh, the job at Colonial Winsburg that I had for 35 years. Uh, uh, one, one day I got up and I told my husband, I said, well, I'm going down to the, uh, the employment office. I was already getting unemployment. I said, I'm going down to an unemployment office. And I didn't know why I was going. I was getting in, I was getting in unemployment. There was no reason. So I went down there and I stood in line. So when I got to the counter, the lady says, uh, can I help you? I said, well, uh, can you check my unemployment? I'm still not knowing why I'm there. And so she told me what I had. I said, okay. I said, and out of, out of the clear, I said, uh, are you looking uh, uh, for uh, any help? And this was at the Virginia Employment Commission. And she says, well, uh, uh, I don't know, but uh, you probably need to talk to the boss. So uh, I waited to talk to him and he said, and he called me back there and he says, well, I tell you what, uh, come in and talk to me tomorrow. So I went in and talked to him and um, he hired me. I had no inkling of going to a Virginia employment looking for a job. And that's just one instance when you do things that you know that is not, doesn't make sense. It's not reasonable. And you and you go and you follow through with it, because his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And if you stay open to what yeah. he's saying to you, and if you uh, don't cry like I think Juanita was saying, your life with so much uh, many distractions, you you can't get the message because you have too many distractions. So hearing from God. It takes a relationship, not just uh, Sunday school and church. And it takes a personal relationship and time spent with him, not when you need anything, 
not when you want anything, but just time with him because he is God. Amen. Amen. Well said. And that pulled together both parts. So there was a little wilderness season going on because she had lost her job. But in that wilderness season, she was able to follow God's direction and his word for her and put her into the place where she was able to get a job. And this many years later, it's still a testimony for somebody else to be able to know that in that wilderness, they can hear God and he can move in their lives. That's preparing the way of the Lord. We can end the lesson right now. Amen. <laughs> um, but see how that just that half of the verse, if we you pick it apart and you start asking some questions, it can bring new life to that verse. Um, and so the next part is he went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Um, John obeyed God and carried out what was asked of him. So in that will, he sees like, I want you to go out and I want you to preach and preach the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Do you do what God asks of you? Sometimes he's asking stuff that we want to do. Sometimes he's asking us stuff to do that we don't want to do. But do we do what he asks? And John went into all the country. He obeyed God fully. Do you do what God asks of you fully or in part? Well, I want to go to this part of the country, but I don't want to go to that part of the country. Do we do it all? John preached a, a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. What is repentance? We've been talking about that in Bible study. Reverend Grace has given us a lot of information about repentance. So if you haven't watched those, go back and watch those. It'll help with that question. And how are repentance and forgiveness connected? Do you need to repent and ask God to forgive you for not doing what he's asked of you? and not at, done it fully, I might add. Do you believe God has forgiven you? Do you forgive others? Do you forgive yourself? Does God withhold forgiveness if we withhold forgiveness? And what does it look like in our daily walk if we have been forgiven and given forgiveness? So all of those are things that come along with the teaching about repentance and forgiveness and doing what he's asked us to do. And as I, I go through and, and do slides, you can always be typing and raising your hand and we'll be able to pick up even if I've gone to the next slide, because I know typing sometimes you might not be able to type fast enough. But before we leave from this slide, do we have any other chats to read? Yes, ma'am. There was one that came in from the previous slide about wilderness. And so um, Sister Hogarth had written, when I found myself in the wilderness, I have had to protect myself spiritually. That has meant eliminating some people and circumstances from my life and focusing on God and God's will for my life. Amen. Amen. All right. So keep thinking about those questions. Keep answering and we're going to move on because I told you it was a lot of questions. <laughs> Let me see. Okay. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. Uh, God's plan for John the Baptist was foretold in the book of Isaiah, the prophet. Do you believe God has a plan? And John was assigned the task of preparing the way for the Lord and proclaiming the people should also prepare the way for the Lord. What does it mean to prepare the way? What does it practically look like uh, to prepare the way of the Lord? And have you done anything this week to prepare the way for the Lord? and make straight paths for him. What does it mean to make a straight path? In our daily walk, do we make straight paths for him or are we making the path crooked? What do, how, do, how do you prepare the way? How do you make paths straight? Are we messing up the paths as we're going? 
Um, and what is his plan for you? And Jeremiah tells us he has a plan for us, but what is his plan for us? And a lot of people don't know because maybe they haven't heard from him or maybe they haven't spent time in his presence to hear what his plan is for them. Or maybe their plan is speaking louder to them than his plan, but he has a plan for us because he knows who we can reach, how we can reach them and what ways we can go about doing that. And that's part of his plan for us. So if we're listening, he can show us how and when and with whom to carry out his plan to prepare the way for the Lord. It's all connected. So as you're thinking about these questions, go ahead and type it in. You, you'll get the PowerPoint. So you'll have all these questions that you and the Lord can talk about. <laughs> and then verse five, is saying every valley shall be filled in every mountain and hill made low the crooked road shall become straight the rough way is smooth and all people will see god's salvation what a wonderful verse um, because of christ's first coming which they are building up to at this point and his ultimate second coming we can repent and be forgiven when we do that, our valleys and our mountains and our crooked roads and our rough ways will all be filled in, leveled out, straightened out, and smoothed out. Isn't that a blessing to know that as we accept him, he does those things for us? Now, I'm not going to say it's all going to happen immediately, but in our walk with him, uh, he will do those things. Does the filling of your valley and the leveling of your mountains and the straightening and the smoothing of your road happen all at once? Hmm, why or why not? And what have you learned in the valley or coming over a mountain or traveling on the crooked road or a road that wasn't so smooth? And how can you prepare the way of the Lord for someone who might be in a valley, who is climbing up a really steep mountain or who is traveling on the crooked and a rough road. And all will see God's salvation. What is God's salvation? Can you tell somebody about what God's salvation is? Is there a difference between seeing his salvation and receiving his salvation? Have you received God's salvation? We have sometimes people who've been in church a long time but being in church doesn't mean you've received his salvation. I mean, we have to have that salvation in order to, to go back with him in his ultimate second coming. So in our life, one of those first things is have we heard from God and received his salvation? And we can't prepare the way for the Lord if we haven't prepared the way for the Lord in our hearts and received him. So can you see how all of these verses are connected with the things that we are to be doing as we prepare the way. All right, do we have any chat? We do. Um, Sister Helen Bowman wrote, as stated in Jeremiah 29 and 11, God says he has good plans to give us an unexpected end. God's plans for us in a way are revealed in his many promises to us. In our relationship with him, we can see his plans and us. Amen. Okay, well, we keep moving, keep keep answering, but we keep moving because we running out of time. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might be the Messiah. Why were the people waiting expectantly? And what what were they waiting for? If you think about um, the end of the Old Testament to this point in time. Um, God has been silent. And so they were anticipating that there was some king coming because that was what the prophets had said. So they were waiting and they were waiting expectantly. How do you wait? Uh, do you wait with a, a, a air of expectancy? And they were wondering in their hearts, what do you wonder about in your heart? What has God put in your heart that you are wondering about? And if John, they were asking, it's John the Messiah. Do you know who the Messiah is? Sometimes we mistake who people are in, in, in life, in our fleshy bodies. We can't make the mistake of 
knowing who God is. We have to know who he is and the savior, because if we don't know who he is, we can be following any path. We can be going down any road and we don't want to do that. We want to make sure we know who the Messiah is. Amen. All right. Okay. And John answered them all. I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful uh, than I will come. The straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So what is baptism? As Baptists, we believe in full immersion of baptism. What is it? What is water baptism? What is Holy Spirit and fire baptism? Have you been baptized? Um, John knew his place and he pointed the glory back to God. Do you know your place in your relationship with God? He knew he was not the one that they were looking for. And he, he pointed the glory back to him. Do you try to take God's glory? When he's working through you and doing things through you, do you try to take the glory for what's happening? Do you examine your intent to make sure you are doing things for his glory? John the Baptist couldn't got a big head, you know. He was like, he was deemed the one to prepare the way for the Christ. He could have said, you know, oh, I got that. But he knew his place with God and he did not try to take that glory. All right, I'm watching our time. And I'm aware that where we are. Oh, so I know that some of these we'll get to, some of them we won't. This one is talking about the winnowing fork. What is that? The threshing floor and the wheat and the shaft and the unquenchable fire. He used this example because he knew that they would know what that process was. We just get the bread out the store. <laughs> but there's a whole lot of processes that go into it before it gets uh, to be that loaf of bread. So what do those images represent? There's meaning in those things. Uh, will you be counted among the wheat or the chaff? We want to be the wheat. We don't want to get burned up like the chaff. And why is this passage being used in a Sunday school lesson during Advent season? Why are we talking about a, uh, the process of uh, getting the, the wheat out from the kernels and threshing floor and winnowing floor? What? Why would he have that built in to that lesson? You know, think about, he does things for a reason. And then our last verse is, and with many words, John extorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. John strongly urged, as ex exhorted, he strongly urged, he encouraged the people and proclaimed the gospel. And these are two questions I hope you really, really ponder. If the faith that we say we have in Jesus does not compel us to share about the Jesus we have faith in, then should we question our faith? And if you were lost, or unsaved, and every Christian shared the gospel as much or as little as you do, would you ever hear the gospel? So these are things we have to think about because that's what John the Baptist was doing. He was going out, he was telling everybody about Jesus and the good news and he was coming and we really wanted to align with him. And he had that faith in him. Do we have that faith in him? And why wouldn't it compel us to tell somebody else if we knew about the goodness of Jesus and what he can do in our lives? Why wouldn't we want to tell somebody else? That's a blessing. And we should want to encourage and urge other people to come to that saving faith knowledge that we have. Amen. And so we'll play a little piece of this because I want you to just know that. The song exists, and I'm going to send you the words and the link to where you can find it.
It is a beautiful song. You will get the words. That's what we're called to do. And if we're hearing him, obeying him, giving him the glory, fulfilling his plan in our lives, we are going to be preparing the way for the Lord. Amen. Amen. And pastor, it is in your hand. Amen. Amen. We want to thank Reverend Graham for that beautiful uh, teaching of John the Baptist appears. Uh, what a wonderful teaching, uh, something that we can take uh, from this lesson and meditate upon. And the questions that she ask us can only be answered by us. So that means that we have to uh, look at ourselves and answer the questions that Reverend Graham raised for us this morning. But we know that John the Baptist comes on the scene. Uh, that was silence. Uh, 400 years of silence from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But within that silence, there was an expectation uh, that a Messiah would come, one that who would overthrow Roman rule, one who would set Jerusalem free uh, from tyranny and oppression. But God had to send a forerunner. God had to send a precursor to his son, Jesus Christ, in order to soften the hearts of the people, in order to make the way straight for him to come. Uh, just like uh, if the president uh, comes to Williamsburg, uh, there would be a delegation coming uh, to clear the way for him. Security would come to clear the way for him. Well, John the Baptist was sent to clear the way for the Messiah to come. Uh, some people wondered, was he the Messiah? And as Reverend Graham said, no, uh, he stayed in his lane. He knew what his job was. And he said, my description, is to baptize you with water, but one coming after me. I'm not worthy to uh, unloose his leases on his shoes. I'm not worthy, but I'm gonna baptize you with the water and he's gonna baptize you with fire. And he's going to do what? He's gonna baptize you with the fire and the Holy Ghost. And so we know that Christ was coming, but in that coming, uh, John the Baptist was getting us ready. He was playing his part in connecting prophecy. Uh, he quoted uh, the, the, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah and all of the things because everything had to be fulfilled uh, with John and with Jesus. Fulfilling prophecy. God wanted to make sure that every dot was connected in order that the work and everything that God's word had said would come to pass, would come to pass. So nothing should be uh, left undone. So we see that uh, John the Baptist was telling him that even when he comes to baptize you with the fire and the Holy Spirit, he has a fan in his hand. Isn't it wonderful to know that as we go through the process of redemption, as we go through the process of transformation, if those things get too hot for us, he has a fan a fan of comfort, a fan to keep us, a fan to keep us alive, a fan to, to just help us on through. So never take for granted that as we go through our processes, as God gives us his Holy Spirit and burns off a lot of the things that displeases him and put us in alignment with God, uh, if it gets too hot for us, he has the fan in his hand. He has what you need in his hand in order to get you through that process. And so again, uh, we know that um, uh, John was described, he was described uh, like unto uh, the prophet Elijah, Elijah. And so one that would come, one that would teach, one that would uh, pave the way for the savior to come. And uh, as uh, Reverend Graham said, that every valley should be filled and every mountain and hill should be brought low. In other words, all of these things have to submit to the will of God. The mountains, the valleys, and all of those things, the crooked places got to be straight and the rough places gonna be smooth and all flesh to see his salvation together. So all of these things were fulfilled in John. Now you and I serve in sort of like a John the Baptist. What you mean about that, Pastor? Well, you and I, every time that we let our light shine, every time we, we stand up for righteousness and justice, every time we help the poor, every time we obey God's gospel through Jesus Christ, every time we do what is right uh, uh, for the kingdom, we are preparing the way of the Lord because he's coming again. And so since he's coming again, now you and I are forerunners 
of Jesus' second return. So that means what? We got to be just like John. We got to stay in our lanes. We got to know what our purpose is. We got to do just like John. We got to point to the one who is coming. We got to point to the one who can save. We got to point to the one who can heal and who can deliver. So in a real sense, you and I are just like John. We are forerunners. We are precursors to Christ's second coming. And we better get in a hurry because the signs of the times point to that he's coming. And we have an expectation as the world continues to, 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 to deep and go deeper in, in immorality and ungodliness and all of the things, it's, it's been fulfilled or it has been prophesied that these things would come. And so as these things are coming, we got to be on our job just like John the Baptist and pave the way for the Lord's second coming, which means that your life and my life ought to be pointing the way for one to come after us to make sure that when he comes, we are in alignment with his will, his way, and his kingdom. So again, don't, don't just think it's John the Baptist. It's us also preparing for the second coming of Christ. Again, we want to thank Reverend Graham for that wonderful teaching this morning on this lesson. John the Baptist appears. Now you and I are on the scene. So we've got to do our job as well. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, we just want to thank you for this lesson. We want to thank you, Lord, for uh, what John did in the preparation of your first coming. And then, Father, now help us in the preparation of your second coming. Because, Lord, we know that every prophecy was done and it was fulfilled in the time of John. But there were other prophecies uh, that were made uh, for Christ's second coming. And so, Father, we, we want to thank you for calling us as you call John, Lord, to prepare the way for your second coming. So strengthen our hands and our feet and our eyes and our tongue to let our light shine and let us not be ashamed, Lord, to uh, uh, pave the way for your second coming. John was bold. John was, 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 was connected to your kingdom. So Father, help us to be bold. Help us to be connected to your kingdom so that when Christ comes, Lord, we have done our part to prepare the way of your second coming. And Lord, we thank you for our teacher. We thank you for all of our hearers. And now, Father God, we pray that you would bless the sick among us, bless the bereaved among us. And Lord, we thank you because just like you came the first time and that was a great expectation, there's also a great expectation for your second return. So Father, we thank you for preparing the way for your second coming. Now that we are closing out Sunday school and entering into worship, we pray that you pour out your spirit afresh among us, mm -hmm. that we'll be encouraged to go on and prepare the way for your second coming. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.